the Sackler Colloquia on the Science of Science Communication, where scientists and communication professionals come together to write a better future for communicating science. So today I'm going to be talking about joint work that I've done with Jonah Berger on the science of sharing and the sharing of science. And I actually want to begin with a personal story to motivate my search for answers about why some scientific discoveries are widely shared while others languish. All right, so I'll begin with the tale of two studies. Both of these studies were published in leading scientific journals in 2012, and both involved professors being studied and exploring whether or not they discriminated against students on the basis of race and gender. The first study on which I was a co-author, that's the personal story, involved professors receiving emails from prospective students seeking an opportunity to meet and discuss research opportunities and we varied the names of those students to signal their race and gender. We found significant discrimination against minorities, as well as insignificant, although inferior treatment of Caucasian females. And this study was published in the spring of 2012. A few months later, a similar and fabulous study was published in the fall of 2012. In this study, professors were asked to rate student applicants for lab manager positions, and names of those students were varied to signal their gender. Significant bias was detected against females in this study, and cleverly, the authors also measured the wage gap offered to female versus male applicants. A goal of both of these studies was to move knowledge forward, but another goal was to stimulate discussion about bias in the academy. Although these two studies might seem to have very similar popular appeal, they were on very similar topics, they had wildly different receptions. As you can see, the first study actually failed in achieving its goal of generating a widespread conversation about bias in the academy, while the second was a tremendous success, generating an incredibly valuable conversation about bias in academia. As this graph shows, Searches for academia and bias skyrocketed on Google shortly following the publication of the second study, while the first generated no reaction whatsoever. While well, it's fantastic that both of these man that either of these manuscripts generated a conversation about bias in the academy, after observing one failure of my own work and one success, I wondered, why is it that two such similar scientific findings could generate such different patterns of propagation? What can I learn from this? And that takes me to the topic of today's talk, which is what predicts what scientific findings are widely shared. And I'm gonna be telling you about recent research on the science of sharing. So I wanna begin actually by going back in time to my days as a graduate student when I split my hours between sleep, data analysis, and reading the New York Times online. <laughs> I became curious when the New York Times began posting a list of the most widely emailed articles on its website. And I wonder why do some articles make it onto this list while others fail? As a social scientist and lover of big data, it wasn't long before I came up with a solution to solve my curious problem. And that was, I hired someone to build a web crawler and visit the New York Times website every 15 minutes and scrape all of the news articles that appeared on the website, as well as their precise locations on the site and whether or not they were on the most emailed list. This data, which I collected for about three months and amounted to about 7,000 articles in 2008, allowed me to analyze what kinds of content drive what makes the most emailed list after carefully controlling for exactly what was featured where and for how long. So the question my co-author and I needed to answer in order to analyze this data was what theories did we have about what might drive the New York Times most emailed list so that we could test those theories. The first is a very natural prediction that comes from extensive social science research showing we care deeply about the impressions we make on others. So we all wanna be known as the person who shares interesting and unexpected news, and, and therefore we very intuitively expect more interesting and more surprising content to be shared. Along similar lines, if we share a new review of a fantastic restaurant or some suggestions on how to cure the common cold, that suggests that we're in the know and valuable connections to have. So that will be self-enhancing and we expect useful content to be shared. A little less intuitively though, we also expect more positive news to be shared for self-enhancement reasons. We all wanna be associated in others' minds with the positive and so we would wanna share those kinds of positive stories to create those kinds of impressions and connections. 
Another motive, though, that we think might drive a lot of sharing is social bonding. So a lot of people have even argued that communication evolved as a form of social bonding, as a way to help us connect with others, keep tabs on people in our social networks. And therefore, we think sharing might be motivated in part by social bonding. One reason that we might share things and, and form stronger connections through social bonds is over emotional experiences. It turns out that having shared emotional experiences brings us closer to other people. And so if we share emotional articles, we may be able to use sharing to enhance bonds. We also all thought that sharing could for, be a form of emotion regulation. When we experience strong emotions in response to an article, for instance, the activating effect or the anxiety producing effect of reading a story about terrorism, or the awe-inspiring impact of reading a story about the search for life on other planets. That is difficult to regulate, and in order to make sense of those extreme emotions, it's actually helpful to discuss them with others. So we expect highly activating emotions to be widely shared. While on the flip side, deactivating emotions like sadness cause us to withdraw into ourselves. So we predicted that deactivating emotions would reduce sharing. So let me now dive into an actual analysis of the data. And what I can show you first is that advertising matters, as you might expect. So for instance, a one standard deviation increase in the time a story spends as the lead article on the New York Times homepage increases its likelihood of making the most emailed list by about 20%. But what's amazing is that content matters almost as much as advertising, and in some cases, more so. So first, we see that some of these intuitive things matter quite a lot. After controlling for how long an article spent on the homepage and where, we see that more interesting, surprising, and useful articles are more likely to make the list. But more exciting still, if I can get this to work, oh, more positive and more emotional stories are also significantly more likely to make the list. And we also see that stories containing more activating emotions are more likely to make the most emailed list. So stories involving anxiety, anger, and awe are more likely to make the list, while deactivating emotions like sadness reduce an article's chances. Maybe someone could just click whenever I raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a natural question you might be asking is, how will this translate to the sharing of science? And in order to that answer that question, my co-author and I actually collected new data specifically for today's event. What we did with that data is we actually, we went out and we asked the approximately 4,000 authors of articles that were published in leading science and social science journals in the first half of 2013 if they would provide summaries to us for a lay audience of their scientific discoveries. About 20% agreed, and so we collected 845 summaries of new scientific discoveries. There are 474 unique summaries described in our data set, and because multiple co-authors actually provided summaries to us on many occasions, we have 231 unique sum descriptions of research, excuse me, unique scientific discoveries that are summarized by multiple co-authors. So what's really neat about that is we're going to have different descriptions of the same findings, and we'll be able to do analyses to see what content characteristics make a given finding more compelling to the public. So of course, then we needed some measure of how likely a given summary would be to go viral to take off. And what we did is we recruited a separate panel of 8,000 non-scientists to rate a randomly selected scientific summary. And then we collapse those average ratings for each scientific summary in our data to create a measure of how likely an article is to be widely shared. So this data is going to allow me to answer three questions that, that I'll talk to you about briefly today. One, who generates discoveries that are likely to be shared among non-scientists? Two, what predicts a scientific discovery's chances of being widely shared? And three, are certain people particularly likely to propagate scientific discoveries? I'll start with who generates discoveries likely to be shared among non-scientists. All right, so the first really simple analysis we could do was looking at where specifically in what scientific journals a given discovery was published. And what we see is that on average, findings published in, in psychology journals are the most likely to be wildly shared, followed by economics and sociology journals, finally followed by science journals. 
Digging deeper into the data, though, we can actually look at the specific disciplinary affiliations of the authors of each summary. And what we see is that in these analyses, articles about business, psychology, and other social sciences are the most likely to be widely shared, while discoveries in chemistry, human services, biochemistry, gen genetics, ecology, these are less likely to be shared. So to summarize this very intuitive fact, we actually used an automated linguistic classification software program to count the frequency with which people were memorized, were mentioned in each summary. So words like baby, adult, and boy. And what we see is that more frequent uses of humans or references to humans are dramatically increasing the likelihood of science being shared. So we care about science about people. All right, so that's not that surprising, but I think this is. What we see is after controlling for the disciplinary affiliation of an author, so we know whether it's a physics paper or an economics paper, we see that summaries penned by women are significantly more likely to be shared than summaries penned by men. And this is really interesting also because when we looked at our New York Times data, we saw that articles written by women controlling for the topic were more likely to make the most emailed list as well. So we scratched our head, we said, what's going on here? Well, when we look at the scientific summaries penned by women, readers tell us that they're more interesting, more useful, and more comprehensible. <laughs> All right, so we can dig a little deeper into this, though, and we can say, is it that a woman and a man who are a co-author on the same scientific discovery do the women write about these in more compelling ways? And actually, the answer to that question is no. So women and men are equally good at conveying the same scientific discovery. And what this means is that we're seeing women actually choose to work on more shareable topics. So it's not that we're better at describing our work, but we work on things within economics or psychology that are more likely to be shared. All right. Let me turn to the most practically useful question that I'll discuss today, and that's what predicts a scientific discovery's chances of being widely shared. And I want to begin by actually sharing a specific summary from our data to give you a flavor for what we're working with here. So one scientist wrote, we're trying to build new types of crystal by combining layers from different materials. We've previously shown that these can have many applications in digital and analog electronics. In this work, we were able to turn light into electricity with a high conversion rate using our new structures made from graphene and tungsten disulfide, both atomically thin layered crystals. This had a middling likelihood of being shared. But a co-author wrote about the very same work in a far more compelling way. This co-author wrote, we produced a device that, although atomically thin, can strongly absorb light and convert it to electricity in a very efficient way. For every 100 photons of light, 30 are converted to electricity, which is a value comparable to the best solar cells on the market. And this was far more likely to be shared. So what we're going to be able to do in our statistical analysis is compare different co-author summaries and look at how the content differs to see what predicts the likelihood of highly shared communication. And we actually see very similar patterns here to what we saw in our New York Times study. So first, and very intuitively, if a co-author writes about the same discovery and makes it sound more interesting or more likely to reflect positively on a sender, it's more likely to be shared. No surprise there. But in addition, if you write about the same work and, and explain why it's useful more effectively than your co-author, that's also more likely to be shared. Most exciting still is that if you can convey the same scientific discovery in a way that's more emotionally resonant, you increase your likelihood of sharing dramatically. That's the second most important factor in our model. And finally, we do see a significant, although very small, effect of being more positive. So turning back to the two examples I showed you a moment ago, you can see that summary two, which was more effective, put this, uh, these ideas to use by highlighting how the work was useful, as well as relying on emotive and positive language. This suggests that by choosing our words very carefully, we can increase the likelihood that our own scientific discoveries and content will be widely shared. The final question I want to briefly touch on is whether certain people are particularly likely to propagate scientific discoveries. And the answer to that question is actually yes. So specifically, actually when men and women are exposed to the same scientific summaries, men are significantly more likely to say they'll pass them along to others. And they view the same summaries as more interesting, more comprehensible, and more useful, which explains this gap in their likelihood of propagating science. 
We also see that minorities are more likely than Caucasians to pass along the same exact scientific summaries. And this is because they view them as more interesting, emotion-inducing, comprehensible, useful, and more likely to reflect positively on them if shared. So I wanna highlight some key takeaways that I've, I've provided today. And the most important is that we can influence whether or not our work is shared using careful thought in describing our work. We can highlight why it's useful, we should rely on emotional language. We should emphasize the positive. And finally, and most intuitively, we should focus on what's interesting and surprising. We also see that men and minorities appear most receptive to propagating science. And finally, that men study less shareable topics, which is a new and exciting finding that seems worthy of further investigation. <laughs> so I don't want to wrap up where I began and suggest that this tale of two studies may be easily explained simply by the titles chosen by the authors. <laughs> As you can see with these titles, the second study, which generated an incredibly valuable conversation about bias in the academy, conveyed that the work was useful, emotional, interesting, and surprising, whereas my own esoteric title failed to do so. And so in conclusion, I hope today I've given you some ideas about how to more effectively communicate science, and I thank you for your time. <laughs>